Can you break up with God? G'day, Paul Clark here, lead minister of Redcliffe Uniting. If you like what we do, like, share, subscribe. Okay, I need to get you up to speed. A couple of years ago, we started journeying through the book of Exodus. As a congregation, we're on a significant journey. And I really felt like God had something to teach us through this story. A story that has echoed through history and empowered the end of apartheid, slavery, and the civil rights movement, to name just a few. It's been a really, really profound journey. So we're heading back. And I have to remind you of where we're up to in the story. The Hebrew people had become slaves in Egypt. They cried out to God to rescue them. And after a generation, God sent Moses to rescue them. Through a series of cataclysmic events, plagues, miracles, and the gushing of water, the nation of Israel was born. They began this journey to the promised land, the promised end. God chose a bunch of nobodies to become somebodies that all the world might know there was a God in Israel, that all nations might be blessed and come into the presence of God. What we realized early on is that these people had been slaves for generations. They needed to learn to be free. And ironically, to be free, they needed law, a culture that defined who they were and what they were going to be it would help them become that peculiar people that would draw others to God. The way that this was brought about was not through some legislative process, but through a relationship with God, a relationship where God's character shone through that, that, those laws. And we've used that as a metaphor a lot. And I'm really sorry because I know not everyone has those relationships. And I feel bad about that sometimes. So the Ten Commandments was the wedding day. It's when the people made their vows to God. And even though God's presence was with them tangibly, visibly, actively, this journey had been difficult, like all relationships. We left the story soon after the wedding day. Israel had had an affair on their wedding day. They had embraced the golden calf. Yahweh was too hard to nail down, too hard to deal with. The golden calf, now that was a God they defined themselves, the God they wanted rather than the one true God, the God they needed. Yahweh, he demanded purity, fidelity and faithfulness. And that was just so hard. Why is God so petty about these things? But if you've been in a relationship, a significant relationship, you need purity, fidelity and faithfulness for that relationship to work. So it's not an unreasonable thing. I mean, Becky, I want to date other girls. Why are you so upset about that? Obviously, this left God angry and broken. God said to Moses, because of my promise, because of my goodness, you can still have the land. I'll send an angel to go with you get you established, but I'm not coming. The people realized what they had done and they were shattered. Moses said, Lord, if you don't come, what's the point? The promised land is empty without you. I'm building a home. I know my home would mean nothing without Becky and the kids. That's when you suddenly realize, hang on, hang on a sec. Is this a breakup story? You should be able to relate to breakup stories. I mean, we all have them. It's a common human experience. Some of the biggest musical hits are, are breakup songs, not your we are never, ever, ever getting back together type of song, but the regret song, the, the heartbreak song. I want you back. Don't care what I have to do. You know, we can't go on together with suspicious minds. I mean, I remember pining as a teenager over, nothing compares, nothing compares to you, or with or without you, with or without you, oh, I can't live with or without you. Okay, singing was a bit off there. But what was your heartbreak song? Anyway, I've prepared many couples for marriage. I've been amazed how many of these couples have breakup stories. 
The couple have discovered something about each other that they didn't know that they don't like. It's not always even something bad. It's just this person is different to me. And then they have to decide, is this the person? Do I really love this person? Is this going to work? And what I've seen is that when couples work through these breakups, it is so foundational and strengthening to their relationship. Now you might decide, no way, this person is crazy. We shouldn't get married. Sometimes that's a wise decision. But when couples work through significant differences, it significantly strengthens their relationship. If you can sort out significant financial, family or parenting issues, you can sort out almost anything. Becky and I have a breakup story, I'm sorry. When you fall in love, you fall in love with an ideal. Here's Becky and here's the ideal. This is who I want her to be. This is who I hope she is. And as I get to know her, I find out she's actually not that. I wanted Becky to be more publicly affectionate, to show people her love for me. I think it was my insecurity speaking. See, somebody loves me. But Becky's not like that. Becky's modest and humble. So we were at this youth camp and Becky wasn't the way I wanted her to be. And I got all righteously angry, which is code for I had a sook. I went to bed and I couldn't sleep. I wrestled and wrestled and I'm thinking, she's not like this, she's not like that, she's not perfect. I'm gonna dump her, she's dumped, it's over. I didn't get an ounce of sleep. After a few hours, I got up and I walked around the campsite all night. It's over, it's over. Meanwhile, Becky's sleeping like a baby. She knew nothing about this. Anyway, one of my friends got up at dawn and finding me awake says, let's play tennis. So we're playing tennis and I'm getting smashed because I'm stewing over Becky. I'm just wanting to dump her, to hurt her as much as she hurt me. Then Becky walks onto the tennis court, just glowing with glory, like God was when Moses was cleft in the rock in chapter 33. And this girl, she makes the sun shine brighter, the birds sing sweeter. I started playing tennis really well and I turned the game on its head. And I realized she is the one. What an idiot. We can work it out or I can get over myself. I don't get what I want. Maybe God is giving me better than what I want. In this story, Moses and God are working out the breakup. The God they want, the cow God, isn't the God they need. So there's repentance, there's humility, there's reconciliation, and they renew the covenant. God says, okay, back up the mountain, let's do this again. And God reiterates his character. And that's really important because God is saying, this is who I really am. Fall in love with this. And what we then read is one of the most profound statements in history. Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Wow, if there was ever a statement of what we need as children growing up, teenagers blooming, workers working, leaders leading, it defines great psychology, great leadership, great culture, but only, only with the rest of the quote. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Teachers know, police know, parents know, you can't have grace, mercy, love and forgiveness without justice. A world without justice is forever broken. We get hung up on the accountability. Believe me, as a pastor, all hell breaks loose when we try to hold people accountable. But look at the magnitudes, thousands, thousands of love, three or four accountability. And we worry about the three or four. In human psychology, it's taken us thousands of years to come up with this profound balance. And here it is in a 4,000 year old crusty document. The cow God has got nothing on this. 
So the question for us, you might think, is what relationship do I need to restore? And maybe you do, but I want to ask you this question. Have you had a breakup with God? Because we do. We think God should be this way, that way. I prayed, God didn't answer. I didn't get what I want. In fact, things got worse. Terrible things are happening and God, where are you? Now you could see this as a cop out. This is just Paul's excuse for why God doesn't answer prayers. But what I've discovered in my life is when God says no, that's when I've got the most to learn. That's when it's about me submitting my will and my ego to whom God is and saying, okay, the God who has chosen me is so much better than the God I want to choose. So what have I got to learn here? Where are there things in your life that you think God has let you down on? But if I'm really honest, I wasn't really living faithfully. I just wanted my way. Maybe we need to renew the covenant. The good news is God is willing to do that. God is willing to renew the covenant. Look at Jesus, the new covenant. Just a word on one part of this story. As they go into the promised land, God says, I'm going to drive out the inhabitants of the land. Don't make a treaty with them. It's just going to lead to compromise. This is part of the story of them setting up this pure culture that would, in the end, bring the other nations in. There was this sense that we've got to do this with purity. We've got to do this with 100% or it won't work. And the sad thing is, well, firstly, they did compromise. They didn't do it with purity. But secondly, at the end of the day, they discovered it really wouldn't have mattered how pure they kept it. The corruption wasn't just with the other nations. It was already in them. They were bringing the problem with them. I mean, they had just worshipped a golden cow. This becomes a bit of a dangerous passage because we think, okay, we come to Australia, don't make a treaty, don't compromise with the locals, clear out the land. No wonder we need Reconciliation Week. And that's fed some of the expansionist policies of Christendom. But this part of the story is halfway along. It's not the end of the story. And that's why the Bible can be dangerous. You have to know how to handle it. The big lesson here was that this approach didn't work. That's not the way to do it. Purity is good, fidelity, faithfulness, but puritanical is bad. And the irony is the reason they were trying to keep pure keep the nations out was to bring all the nations in so it's not that God has an exclusivist policy it was God working out how to set up an inclusivist policy and at Pentecost last week we saw the answer comes in Christ and the Holy Spirit fidelity faithfulness to God is important but it's Christ's fidelity Christ's purity that brings the other nations in it's not because we get it right it's because Christ got it right and that helps us when we're building this hub because should we be making agreements and partnership with other agencies? Will we compromise and lose our way? They are good questions. But what we learn is it's not so much about who we exclude, but how we remain faithful to our first love. That's our priority. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will look after itself. That's the final part of the story that we didn't read. Moses has this encounter with God. He walks down the mountain and he doesn't realize his face is glowing. And he walks up to people and it's like, man, you're glowing, radiation, radiation. You've had that experience where you're in love with someone. You can't help but talk about them, gush about them. And people say, man, you're glowing. Do you like that person? No, how did you know? Moses is so full of the love of God, he just glows. And that is such a powerful part of this story. We often center on obeying God. We've got to try harder to obey. No, I think the message is stay in love with God. Try harder to stay in love. Then it all becomes easier. How do I stay in love? Spend time with the God, delight in God, listen to God, care for God, think the best about one another, give your gifts. Sometimes life is hard, we have a breakup, we argue, 
but we repent and confess and say sorry and forgive and work it all out and start again. That's very much part of the Christian gospel. And we have a God who's willing to forgive us and love us. And he demonstrated that so powerfully on a cross. And so we can come, we can get it wrong. We can confess, we can say sorry, and we can glow again. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what has your spirit stirred up in our lives? What relationships are on the rocks that perhaps we need to work on? Perhaps we need to, to swallow our pride, admit our faults, go to someone and say, look, I'm, I'm sorry. Lord, we have to have soft hearts with one another that when people come to us, we can say, it's okay, I forgive you, I forgive you. But the bigger question, are we hanging on to our hurts that we have with you? Have we been let down by you? Do our prayers seem to be empty and unanswered? Have we become estranged from you, disappointed? Lord, help us to examine ourselves and say, well, where has this been my ego? Where is this? <laughs> the disappointment of a God that doesn't intervene. And how can that covenant be restored? How can I concentrate on your character and understand who you are and fall in love with that God, not the God I want? Lord, do your work in us. Amen.